Today I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, uh, three things. The first one is give you a bit of an update of the, um, the latest happening in the markets for vegetables. And I've got some data that goes up to April this year, so it's pretty up to date. And the second thing I want to talk about is the market uh, export market mapping tool that we've developed with uh, Ausveg. And the third thing I want to talk about is the progress of the export strategy. Uh, the first thing is to talk about how the, how the market's performing. And if you just look at a historical perspective of Australia's exports, you know, it's been very volatile. And we had a sort of a, a, a cavern, in, you know, a, a valley in the middle in about 2009 where a whole lot of things crept up on us. And one of them was the Aussie dollar got to parity. And we also had that, that millennium drought um, and a whole lot of other factors. Previously, we had good trade in, in various products. and But... Uh, over the time, um, it's been very volatile. It's been very much about market access, about, about uh, or the availability of the markets, about competitiveness of pricing and so forth, heavily driven by the Aussie dollar. And uh, we were dominated by hard vegetables and we were very much a trading culture. But that's really changed. In the last four years, we've had a sustained growth and it's been fuelled by the, the favourable Aussie dollar but also by a change in attitude by the industry and a focus by some key players to get into strategic export marketing to become long-term players. And I think there's very strong signs that the Ausveg um, export strategy is starting to, to bite. And we're particularly seeing some growth in green vegetables. So if you look at performance uh, overall, <coughs> um, it's grown in value by 4.8% in the last 12 months. Um, uh, in, 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 but in, it's grown, the long-term compound average rate of growth is about 11%, so it's been quite sustained. It's a down a little bit this year, uh, and part of the, that's heavily driven by uh, a bit, bit of a reduction in potatoes, carrot, uh, not carrots so much, but onions and, and also asparagus in Japan. But um, it, it really is um, pretty strong. The volume's fairly flat, and that's because, um, uh, largely because of, we've lost a lot of business in, in onions in Europe uh, because we are no longer price competitive. There's, uh, the people are storing, uh, the Europeans are storing their onions longer, so that sees the windows dried up, and also New Zealand are more price competitive. Um, the Middle East is, um, <coughs> our, is the strongest in, uh, the market as a, as a block. But Southeast Asia is also very strong. So we've always done good business in Singapore, Malaysia um, and Hong Kong, uh, less, lesser extent in, in Thailand and in Indonesia. Um, but we're well on track to reach the target of, of, um, of 340 million, which is a target set um, um, for the 2020 strategy. It has been sort of derailed a bit, but provided the Aussie dollar stays where it is, and all indications are that it, it will, and if anything, the, the main sort of the smart people in the in the blue suits and the banks are telling us it's going to go down. If anything, so that looks pretty favourable. Um, if you look at uh, by product value, the big thing that we've seen is the is the growth in in green vegetables. The carrots have always been the star performer, and we've always been very competitive in carrots. Um, we're price competitive. We have a better product. Um, we, you know, we grow our qualities better, our taste better, and also we've got a, an integrity thing. So they trust our product. So carrots have always been the star performer, but green vegetables have really, really shown some some boost. Uh, you know, particularly uh, lettuce, celery, uh, brassica, etc. Um, so if you look at you know these the categories here, so. The green vegetables are a very small part of the total share of exports, but they're growing phenomenally. So celery, 51% uh, growth, um, five-year growth. So it's been pretty spectacular. Uh, and that's largely by driven by um, some, some key exporters who have decided to be serious exporters, take a strategic approach, take a long-term approach, develop products and so forth. We're seeing the similar sort of thing in capsicum, broccoli, lettuce. So lettuce has had had good growth. Um, carrots have also, you know, pretty strong growth as well. Part of the reason for the um, growth in, in green vegetables is that the markets become, the, we, we sort of lost a lot of market share in green vegetables in the Asian region to China, and but increasingly people are becoming uh, distrustful of, of to the integrity of Chinese product. And they're particularly sensitive in green vegetables because 
it's associated with you know uh, food safety a lot more than than other vegetables that are cooked so particularly around the salad vegetables and stuff like that so we're seeing some particular gains um, particularly in places like Singapore where um, it's a very price sensitive market but there's a big enough share of the market that want to buy a product that's got they can trust that's got food safety and one of the things about Australia is that we've got very good food safety uh, integrity standards so we've got a reputation for that so you know the, the the years that have been spent with quarantine and restrictions and all that which have been a cost to the industry are actually paying off for us um, and that's really been translated into into some trust and then some market share the um, as I said if you look at the breakdown that's dominated by um, by four categories um, uh, carrots asparagus potatoes onions asparagus have shown strong growth particularly in Japan, but lost a bit last year. <coughs> um, so if you look at share by, very, uh, by country, um, Singapore has become a very strong market for us. As I said, um, Singapore um, is, is a, um, a maturing market. It's, it's one, it's, I think it's the most affluent country in the world. Uh, it's, um, and it's particularly, you know, it's the most price sensitive market in the world. So Singapore is literally on the crossroads of the trading world and they can buy from anywhere it's no market access issues at all it's totally free to anyone and it's been heavily trade driven over driven over it so most of that trade's been driven by importers out of the market but more and more Australian exporters are building direct relationships with supermarkets or with providors and so forth into high-end food and service and that's really starting to kick in for us uh, you know there's been a, a growth in the upper end uh, supermarket chain and upper end food service chains in Singapore and they want tr product they can trust. Um, the Middle East is still strong, heavily driven by carrots but other things coming in there as well. Japan, Japan is, um, has been a strong market for it but it's down this year largely because of asparagus and we built some good trade in asparagus but um, in the last year we've lost that and the market in, for the imports into Japan have dried up. And we don't know why, um, so it's not so much we've lost market share, it's just that the market's shrunk. And um, I think that, you know, we don't know where that's going to go, but that's been a bit of a, there's been a concerted effort to develop that market. And it's had some great success, but it's a matter of monitoring the situation to see where that goes. Uh, Malaysia's down a bit, that's a highly volatile market. Um, Hong Kong, pretty strong market for the same reasons as Singapore. Um, South Korea is heavily driven by processing potatoes, so... We put a lot of crisping potatoes into, into South Korea and they go in, we have a, um, it's a heavily restricted market with strong tariffs but we've got a window of opportunity where we've got six weeks of tariff free when the Americans can't supply. So the crispers want product uh, straight out of off the harvester. They don't want sto the storage, you know, impacts on the quality and they want fresh products and the Americans um, season stretches a bit um, so we can get in there for about six weeks and doing very good trade. And there's all aspects, all op opportunities to build that trade because they like our product. Um, but this year it's down a bit because the Americans <coughs> um, had a, 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 a bigger supply situation. <coughs> uh, market share by destination, I've already talked about this, but um, it's led by the, the Middle East. Um, the Middle East is a polarised market. It's got um, some very, it's, you know, most of the Middle Eastern countries have got a very wealthy upper class and a, and a big, um, big sort of um, tail of uh, I, I, uh, indigenous, uh, not indigenous, um, um, imported workers or you know, immigrant workers uh, that tend to work in, in uh, oil camps, etc. And so there's a, a food servicing. Now that's very price sensitive, but we're doing quite well in the higher end supermarkets there. Um, market access is a, a bit of a barrier in Northern Asia. So there's strong opportunities in Northern Asia for us, particularly in China. Um, Japan, Korea, um, and Taiwan, but and things are improving. But market access is the um, is the big barrier there. <coughs> In terms of the export growth drivers, one of the big drivers is the favourable macroeconomics. So um, we've got um, you know there's the strong affluence in Asia, uh, a strong economic prosperity. And as that happens, there's more trading into the modern trade, you know, the, the supermarkets and the high-end supermarkets and online and uh, high-end food service and less in wet markets. So Australia generally is not competitive in wet markets, but we can be competitive in the, in the modern trade. And that's growing strong, strongly, 
um, you know, the, shrink, the wet markets are shrinking, the supermarkets are growing, online's growing and so forth. So that's really driving it. Um, they've talked about the modern trade. Um, the export culture. So in the last, um, you know, historically Australia's been a, an opportunistic exporter. We, we um, you know, the, the, the traders in the market will send an email saying, I oh, want to give us a quote and we respond to that. Um, but more and more, there's companies strategically in carrots and particularly green vegetables that are looking at long-term building relationships, applying the principles of marketing and export marketing for long-term programs. And that's really starting to kick in. Um, strategic investment by the category leaders. Um, but also the, the Ausveg Hort strategy. <coughs> I'll talk about that very briefly in, in about a few minutes, but the signs that that's kicking in, um, the inbound trade missions are starting to build some relationships. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, the work that's, that Michael Coote's doing is really starting to bite um, and that will evolve over the next three or four years. The exchange rate's good, as I said, um, and um, improving market access into North Asian markets. So that's still a challenge for us, but improving. We've also got a location um, advantage into Asia particularly. And with the tourist trade, we're getting um, a big freight connectivity improvement because... Most of our green veg particularly are going out of here in the, in the cargo holds of passenger planes. And with more tourists, there's more and more cargo capacity. So Emirates are doing something like 160 flights a week. Singapore Airlines the same. With wide body jets with plenty of capacity. So, and the freight rates are favourable out of Australia and good availability, particularly out of Melbourne and Sydney. More problematic out of Brisbane and Adelaide, but certainly out of Melbourne and Sydney. So that's been a big factor. Um, and also, we've got strong relationships. So, Australia's starting to build relationships, um, particularly you know through the inbound missions. And we've had a long history of trading. They trust us. Uh, they you know they trust Australia to to do what they say they're going to do. And they shake hands on a deal. They 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 know it's going to happen. So, that's starting to to really kick for us as well. So, but the thing is that the um, the growing affluence is a key thing, and that's where Australia's competitive advantage is. We're not going to be um, winning on price. We've got to win on, on other factors. And we've got to really look at the higher-end factors. So it's, it's in the higher-end supermarkets in, you know, this is one's in, in Hong Kong, um, you know, where you'll see an apple for $20 for one apple. Um, we, you know, we're not in, in, in that league in, in vegetables, but certainly we're, good, we're getting a lot of presence in there, but also high-end food service. So... We're getting, you know, the high-end hotels, the five- and six-star hotels, and you're getting the quick-serve restaurants like um, Subway, et cetera, that want our lettuce because they trust it, um, you know, the same with the hamburger chains and stuff like that. So that's where we need to be, um, and that's, that's where our competitive advantage lies. Um, I think, you know, the, the heartening thing for me is that we're on a transformation from being opportunistic traders to program marketers, and you can see the the twigs of spring, you know, on the leaves, the you know the, the new buds. It's really starting to show and starting to kick in for us. Um, you know, opportunistic trading is about reactive to inquiries, highly volatile, deal by deal. Um, it's the price negotiation, price driven, um, tends to be agent driven. A lot of it's going out of the market, out of the markets. A lot of agents in the market will consolidate put a container, in an air container or a sea container out in every day or whatever. There's no commitment, low loyalty. So we're, that's where, been where we've, where we've been at. And I'm not saying that's wrong and that's always going to happen, but it's not reliable and it's not sustainable. You can't rely on it. If you've, you know, if, and the key message that I think we need to get across in, uh, today, and I think other speakers will reinforce it, is we can't use exports as a dumping ground. We have to be a long-term trader. So program marketing's about... A long-term commitment. So it's about, being, you know, the, the issue is it always is that um, you're sitting there as an exporter and you're getting um, three dollars for your lettuce in Singapore, and the and the Brisbane market's gone up to six bucks. You're losing three dollars. But if you start thinking that way, then you'll get you, you get you lose it. So you have to be prepared to you know have a long-term view about it, and you and you it'll pay off on, on average over the long term. So you need long-term supply agreements. Within, with end users, if possible, at least providers to, or, or distributors to end users. Customised products, you know, understanding what they want, what varieties they want, how, what their trim level is, what, do they want packaging, what pack size, etc. 
a supply came, on, um, supply an ongoing program um, investment in marketing, you know, doing some in-store work or whatever the market needs, an agreed pricing formula. Usually it's not a fixed price, but it's a price that varies with the market, but, but one where you're not taking the market's highs and lows, um, but you're getting somewhere in the middle with some sort of protection and some sharing of the risk and the volatility. Um, mutual obligation and loyalty and requires critical mass and continuity. So you really need to have critical mass. So you can't really build a program where if you've got asparagus for six weeks. You have to have um, a, a situation where you can supply for at least 30 weeks of the year. And that probably means you either have to have production in a few different states or collaboration with people. So what we're seeing is a lot of collaboration between growers in different states or growers with different products so they can put together a program. But the other reason why you need, need critical mass is that the freight, um, because you pay a lot more for freight if you're getting a sub-container load, if you're putting a few boxes on, on a pallet or a pallet or whatever, you'll pay a lot more. So if you can book freight, you know, and a lot of the successful guys will have a, an AV container going out every night to Singapore every night, um, you know, and they're filling that because they've got the volume and quite often that's through collaboration. Um, in most categories, we can't, not competitive on price. The exceptions there are carrots, you know, we are a highly efficient carrot producer, but anything where there's a lot of labour, um, particularly green vegetables where it's, it's hand planting, it's hand weeding, it's hand picking, it's hand packing, that's very price competitive, uh, very price heavy. Um, but things like potatoes, onions, um, carrots, we can be competitive um, in most areas. So, but we, can, in, we can't sort of rely on that. Uh, so we have to really look at what's a, what's a value proposition around non-price factors. And that could be the variety, growing varieties that people like. And you can't assume that, that a, a variety of celery that Woolworths like is, is going to be desired by people in Asia. Some people like white celery, some people like green celery, some people like long celery, some people like short celery, some people like a package, some people don't. So, you know, with that, some people want to buy the piece, some people want to buy the bunch. So we have to really look at how we can do that to it, to the level that, the, that meets our customer requirements. Quality standards, packaging, branding and providence. Pro providence is really important. Supply chain efficiency. So the way the market's going is towards packs. So I've got a few pack shots here. And I'm not saying this is where we're at at the moment, but we really need to be starting to um, think this way. So we're at, this is where the market's going, towards these high, higher end packaging and so forth with, with very high pricing. It's going to take a five-year journey and product development, all those sorts of things, and developing the market, um, but we have to start that journey. So this is, you know, as I said... Um, it's really about the packaging, the value proposition, the branding. It's very hard to brand, um, you know, non-packed product. Um, you know, so just some some examples. But the point is that um, the, this is what the market wants. This is where a competitive advantage is. So we have to start to develop the skill base to be able to, and the capabilities to be able to start to get on this journey. Um, market access is an issue, um, and this is a, a an example of a market access map that's in the mapping report. Um, there's a lot of red ink in there, particularly in North Asia, uh, but it's improving. So, um, you know, the Middle East, the, the Middle Eastern markets are free, subject to phytosanitary certification. The Asian markets, uh, Southeast Asian markets are open. No tariff, no phyto, anything even, most of them. Some of them in Malaysia. Um, but uh, Thailand's got some issues. Um, Indonesia's got some issues, but... Um, generally, it's improving. Th we're making some progress there, um, and it's a long and protracted progress, but uh, we've got some new access into South Korea with um, broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, uh, spinach, celery and leek, um, carrots into Taiwan from Queensland, the WA. Indonesia, we've got access for seed potato from South Australia and Victoria. So, so some slow progress, but, but it's worth going. The pipeline uh, is in negotiation is, is this. So... You know, I won't go into the detail of it, but basically, um, you know, there's a queue in, for the negotiation process. It has to go through a, tr a trade advisory panel first through the HIA system, the Hort Innovation System. They develop priorities um, and then that goes to the department who then negotiate that. And so there's quite a good pipeline there, but particularly in the North Asian region. So, as I said, that's showing some strong growth for us subject to market access. Just very briefly want to talk about the mapping tool. Um, 
So we, uh, were, we developed the export marketing strategy and, as, and a, as a foundation for that, we developed a mapping tool for vegetables. And um, Ausveg have got a four year funding agreement um, to, to renew this and it's in its second iteration. So it covers uh, 15 prospective markets and 18 categories. So it's a, it's a monster report, it's about 400 pages. Um, and for that reason, it's interactive. Uh, it's designed to go on an iPad. We can say carrots, Bahrain, or celery, Hong Kong, and it'll tell you that, all that. Um, with this, we sort of use a, a tool called Market Potential Index, and it's a tool that sorts markets by their potential. It's a it's a quite a complex algorithm. Our company's been using it for about 20 years across a range of products, and we've perfected it for veg. We think it's got pretty sensitive now to it, um, and so we use that to sort out what are the top 10 markets or whatever. We've got detailed dashboards um, by country and by category. So as I said, we've got in, in the country categories, we've got um, you know how much we export there, uh, who, who our competitors are, what the price points are, what the market access is, what the freight connectivity is, um, et cetera. And then by category, we've got um, similar information about how, what our share is, who our competitors are, what our price points are. So we've got pricing data that shows who our competitors are, where we're at, and so forth, um, and um, so it's a pretty comprehensive bit of work. It's a collaboration between McKinna Ratzel and, uh, Mark, uh, and um, Fresh Intelligence. Wayne uh, Prowse is our collaborating partner. He's got, I think, the best data in the business. Um, so we work together uh, very closely on that to develop that. Uh, it's, um, it's in its um, second year, and uh, it's, um, we are flexible within the limits of the data to change the, the format of that. So if any of you are using it, and you'd like to see some other information, if you put it to us through Ausveg, we'll see whether we can do that, but we're more than willing. So it's, it's, it's evolved um, from last year and it'll evolve again this year. We've added more countries. We added Taiwan this year, which wasn't in last year. Um, so it's, um, it's the latest version of it. As I said, it's a monster report, um, so you have to get on the, uh, on the internet. Um, uh, you have to get it on the iPad to, to make it worth, worthwhile. Um, so it's got sidebars and all that sort of stuff. This is the market potential index tool. I won't go into it in any depth, but it basically measures the potential um, based on, on the willing, you know, the propensity to buy, market access, price competitive, a whole lot of different things. As I said, it's a pretty accurate tool. Uh, we're pretty happy with it. You can get access to it. There's a summary report um, at this address, and um, I think what levy payers can get the full report. We're happy to talk to anyone who wants to use it and we're happy to get feedback from anyone who would like to um, have some suggestions about how we can improve it. Now I quickly want to talk about the export strategy because I'm running out of time. Um, so we've developed an export strategy. Uh, it's now in its second year. Um, I won't go into the depth of it, but basically it's got, um, it's got uh, seven platforms. And then sitting below each of these are programs, so how you actually make this. So the platforms are what we have to do. Then there's programs that tell you how we're going to do it. And then there's action plans that, that, that give some guidance as to who's going to do it, who's going to pay for it, what the timelines are, what the KPIs are. It's about, the first thing's about creating an export culture. So, you know, when we did the research two years ago, um, you know, the, there wasn't a, a lot of people in the vegetable industry weren't, they weren't as advanced as other industries in terms of their interest in exporting. So we're building an export culture through building awareness, through seminars like this, etc. cetera. Um, driving um, product differentiation, as I said, trying to find products that are going to work in, um, in these markets with, you know, on, on a, on a, at a premium price level. Uh, we need to look at the branding. Uh, we need to look at branding at an Australian level, at a category level and at a product level. We need to work that through. Collaboration in the supply chain, as I said, to get the critical mass and volume and continuity, we need to have collaborations. So we're looking at how we can build collaborations between businesses and between to, to put together a, a long-term supply chain. Um, and looking at value-adding opportunities which, for which there are substantial. And the last one's about market intelligence. And, th and this bit mapping tool is a, a part, of the, part of that market intelligence. Um, so uh, again, this is available on the Ausveg website, um, and it, it's too detailed to go into, so I won't even try to. Um, critical factors for sustainable success. You need a long-term commitment. If you're in for the short term, forget it. You, you might win, but you, you probably won't. You, but you won't, it won't be a long-term business commitment, right? long-term business success. You need scale and critical mass. 
and unless you're very big with, with, with growing properties across Australia, you probably need to have um, collaboration with other growers and with other parts of the supply chain. Um, target marketing, you know, deciding which countries you want to go to and, cha and, and which, which channel within market. Do you want to go food service? Do you want to go online? Do you want to go high-end supermarket? Which channel to market? Understanding your customers. What do they want? What, what's their preferences, size, colour, variety, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, differentiating the value proposition to support premium pricing. You know, we're not going to win on price. The Chinese are a third of the price in a lot of most of the products. So we've got to have something better than that. Um, efficient supply chains. Uh, it's all about freight. And, and also efficiency is not just about cost. It's about getting the product there in good condition. And high levels of customer service. So, um, you know, it's, these are sort of proven things. The, you know, the, the, the experiences and the numbers are showing that that these things are really, uh, you know, they're not theoretical, they are working, they are biting. So the final point I'd like to make is that a, a, a viable, sustainable export industry is a good way to improve industry profitability. So even though you mightn't be the slightest bit interested in exporting, the more we export, the more, um, the more power it gives us um, to negotiate in the domestic market. And, you know, uh, for example, some work that's been done by APEL that shows that if they took um, 30,000 tonnes of apples which is 10% of apples, on, put them on the export market, would increase prices by a dollar a kilo. And that's big money. So if we could find some ways to do that, and the same things happen in meat where, you know, Coles and Woolworths no longer set the price of meat. It's, it's buyers in Beijing and, and, um, and, and Shanghai. And that's where we need to get to. So, um, you know, the industry's, you know, building that discipline. As I said, I think the strategy is working. I think um, we've worked on many strategies for many products over many years, and I think that the way this is being managed by Ausvedge, uh, and I'm not just saying this because they're sponsoring this thing, is the best we've seen. Um, Michael Coote's doing a fantastic job, and just he needs to be given as much support as he can. So, thank you very much. <laughs>